Good morning, Soma family. It's good to um, get a chance to talk with you, even though it's at a distance. Um, I'm grateful for it. Hope you're having a great Sunday morning. And I want to begin with a story from the Jesus Storybook Bible. And it's called The Servant King. I want to read just a clip of this for us um, as we get started. So hopefully if the kiddos are still in the room, hopefully this is fun. Jesus' friends were arguing. What about? They were arguing about stinky feet. Stinky feet? Yes, that's right, stinky feet. Now, the thing about feet back then was that people didn't wear shoes. Only, they only wore sandals, which might not sound unusual, except that the streets in those days were dirty. And I don't mean just dusty dirty, I mean really stinky dirty. With all those cows and horses everywhere, can you imagine the stuff on the street that ended up on their feet? So anyway, someone had to wash away the dirt. But it was a dreadful job. Who on earth would dream of volunteering to do it? Only the lowliest servant. I'm not the servant, Peter said. Nor am I, said Matthew. This picture. Quietly, Jesus got up from the table, took off his robe, picked up a basin of water, knelt down, and started to wash his friend's feet. So we'll come back to that story in a second, um, but it's, it's just such a great example of servanthood. And so we've been in this in this series uh, for a few weeks now on the book of First Corinthians, an a, a epistle, a book of the Bible, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Um, but he also wrote it to all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he addresses specific issues in the church in Corinth and intentionally does it in a way that all churches can directly benefit. Many times in this letter, Paul, as he's instructing the church, he talks about the future and the the specifically when the kingdom of God will be here fully. And, and that's when everything's put right. There's no more, there are no more tears, no more death, no more sorrow. And he always seems to have that future kingdom in mind as he's talking to the Corinthians. And it seems to me like it's, it's like a soundtrack to a movie. This, um, future reality undergirds all the action that's happening and sometimes the the volume rises on that on that soundtrack and you notice it by, distinctly and as we go through this series we've titled the future present we're bringing attention to these repeated motifs that come up as Paul is working to establish the church now in light of God's future kingdom. So when we look at this whole book of 1 Corinthians, it can logically be divided into big segments. Uh, you might call them essays, where Paul's addressing, addressing a big topic and, um, and making an argument, making a case, and dealing with an issue in the church, but also doing it in a way that applies to all churches for all time. And a few weeks ago in chapter 1, we, we heard Paul begin his appeal to the church to agree with one another, to not argue, to have unity. And some were saying, I follow Paul. Some were saying, I follow Apollos. Others were saying, I follow Peter. And, and that was the, these like factions in the church were the main issue that Paul was trying to address. And in chapters 1 and 2, just to kind of summarize where we've been, 
uh, chapter 1 and 2, he reminds them that it wasn't any of these leaders who was crucified for them. He, and he goes on to declare that the wisdom of God is revealed, um, that's revealed in Jesus looks like foolishness to the world. And, and that, that, that God's wisdom is given by the Spirit. And all this isn't an anti-intellectual kind of message. It's, um, he's saying, look deeper. Look at things from God's perspective. Almost as if he's saying, don't judge a book by its cover. And in chapter 3, a uh, super important line that, um, one, I think is a super important line. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. And so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He keeps pointing the church back to God instead of him. And today, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, we're looking at how Paul wraps up his essay on unity. This is kind of the last part of this big chunk of 1 Corinthians. And there are two things I'd like to do. One is to look at the text and how it applies directly to the church in Corinth and the issues that they were dealing with. And, and, and second, I'd like to take a principle that Paul uses here and apply it to a, another sphere of life entirely, um, and that's work. So we'll get to that. Um, We've talked about Justin Westcott kind of, uh, has, over the last few weeks, given us a good glimpse into how the church was divided. Um, there was probably an interplay of a lot of things at work, uh, personal preference and um, judgments about which leader was the best one and the wiser one, pride, uh, even race the, and ethnic divides common in the city that has kind of bled into the church. I, I totally imagine there's a hipster Corinthian in there somewhere that who was saying that, you know, I followed Paul before he was cool. Um, and you know, the, who knows, there are lots of reasons for these divisions, but, the, but they had begun to cement themselves into these factions in the church, and that's the thing that Paul's addressing. The metaphors we heard about last week, the uh, church being like a field and a building, those are all meant to recalibrate to the, uh, the Corinthians as to how they should look at the church and the apostles and their role and their identity. And, and the, the, as an answer to these problems of division, I think Paul's kind of putting down his last word here, and, and that's the first verse of our passage, chapter 4, verse 1. And he says, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. I think that is the key verse, the thesis of this long argument and the gospel-centered mindset Paul is trying to establish in the church. And, and I think he's, he wants to establish that because I think that leads to unity. Regard us as servants. So, real briefly, what is a servant? The, the Bible uses the word servant. Um, there are multiple Greek words that are translated as servant in English. And kind of lumping the, all those implications together, you've got slave and like a server, like a, someone who waits tables, uh, an indentured servant, a laborer, um, a steward, like a household manager. Uh, all those things are implied in, in the word servant. Jesus said he came to serve and not to be served. And he famously washed his disciples' feet. Um, what I love about the storybook Bible's uh, approach to that story is it makes it clear that what he did was more similar to scrubbing toilets than to giving somebody a pedicure. Um, so it really was a lowly job that he took um, quietly and, um, and as an example of how we should live. 
and Jesus said he came to serve. He also said that as the Father sent me, so I send you to his disciples, who then made disciples and make disciples. Um, in Philippians chapter 2, another famous passage, um, it says that Jesus, who, um, Jesus took on the form of a servant and humbled himself, um, considering equality with God, not something to be grasped and held on to, and, and, and subjected himself even to the point of death on a cross, humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. And this, as, as we are um, thinking about Jesus and the work that he did on the cross, that um, changes us. It, it brings us into a new identity. It, it changes who we are uh, when we believe in Jesus because we're adopted into his family, we're made his servants, we're sent on his mission. And it's not only the first verse here, but the last, uh, Paul says, imitate me. Um, I think that's also very important. Uh, elsewhere he says, uh, imitate me as I imitate Christ, or follow me as I follow Christ. And so not only should the church regard him and other leaders as servants, they should regard themselves as servants of Jesus as well. And, and we've seen that, that this is part of our identity in the gospel. And, and Paul's working out that, um, that identity and giving them an example to follow, and, and for us to follow in principle, if not in every detail of his life. So, what would it mean for the church in Corinth to regard their leaders as servants of Jesus? I think it means um, if, if we regard church leaders as servants of Jesus, that we realize Jesus is the head of the church, not a human leader. To, to borrow from the example from last week, it's as if Jesus is the general contractor and the architect and we're all laborers. We might, might have different roles and responsibilities, but we're all working together under his direction for his design. And if we regard the church, if we regard church leaders as servants of Jesus, then Jesus is the true head of the church and we're members of one body. We're all connected to Jesus. And, and that means unity. So do you see that? That that's key. Divisions were caused by seeing leaders as captains of these warring factions. Unity comes from seeing them as servants of Jesus, all of in their variety and different ability and talent. They all are serving Jesus, and so Paul is encouraging them to look the the church to look past their leaders to Jesus and identify with him primarily. I think if we regard leaders as servants of Jesus, we'll, we'll see that their servanthood points to Jesus. Paul said himself in chapter 2, I de determined to know nothing but Christ crucified among you. And, and um, realizing that Jesus suffered and died an um, uh, awful death on the cross for us should produce deep gratitude in our hearts. And in verse 7 of this passage, Paul says, What do you have that you didn't receive? And why do you boast as though you didn't? People who are deeply grateful for unmerited favor are usually not the first to argue that they know it all and have it all together. If we regard church leaders as servants of Jesus, um, it should also produce humility. Humble people are not quarrelsome. And um, our, in, in our church in Soma, our approach to health and, and that of the city during this pandemic has created tension and uh, factions in society and as the church as a whole. Um, and 
talking about, if you think through a decision carefully, it's often really hard to understand how anyone else could come to a different conclusion. I know I'm guilty of this. I sometimes arrogantly think too highly of myself and look down on those who would disagree. And, and it reveals often a lack of humility. And the... Um, sorry, if we regard... Lastly, if we regard church leaders as servants of Jesus, it makes much of Jesus. Um, it allows us to look past merely human leaders, and it glorifies the one we're meant to glorify and we're all about. In this passage, Paul says that they're servants of Jesus and stewards of, of Jesus, and it's required that they be found faithful. I think the key is faithful to whom? It's Jesus. Paul's saying they are servants of the Corinthians in a sense because they serve the Corinthians, but truly they're servants of Jesus. Jesus is the master, not the Corinthians. Jesus is the boss that they answer to, not the Corinthians. And he, he actually says, I care very little if I'm judged by you or any human court. So God's opinion outweighs the Corinthians' opinion for Paul. And, and these are radical statements. As um, leaders in SOMA, this year has been a wild ride for all of us and for everyone. And it, as a part of that, um, we've been called cowards by people who... Um, thought we were too cautious with COVID precautions, and we've been called cowards by people who thought we weren't cautious enough. And, and we've talked as, as leaders um, several times about, like, we can't please everyone here. We have to, and that can't be our goal. Um, we have to Look at the information we have, prayerfully consider and, and, and follow the leading of Jesus the best we can as we serve him to serve you. And the, the future present uh, connection here is um, in verse 5, Paul says, Judge nothing before the appointed time. The message says, don't get ahead of the master and jump to conclusions with your judgments before all the evidence is in. So he's really um, talking, he's connecting back to the last chapter where we talked about last week, that last day when there's the foundation of Jesus, we build upon it. That's our the work that we do builds upon that with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, stubble, and hay. And uh, one, of, one set of those materials is going to survive the fire. And that that's the, 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 that kind of judgment where Jesus determines this was worthy and this wasn't. And, and Paul is saying, don't make all of those judgments ahead of time. Let, leave that to, to Jesus. So um, in the end of, of this, just, just as Paul is appealing to the Corinthians to regard him himself and Apollos and Peter as servants, regard us as servants. Justin, Westcott, and Jeff, and Steve, and Chris, and me, and our wives, and MC leaders. And, and remember this last line about Paul where Paul says, imitate me, not only do are we to regard our leaders as servants, we're to regard ourselves as servants. And, and so I want to shift gears here and, and talk about how that affects our work. So how does the gospel, particularly the servant identity, affect day-to-day -day how I work? And this could be paid employment, uh, being a student, raising children, volunteering. When I say work or a job, I'm kind of implying all of those things. 
And it is super, super common to find your identity in your work and what you do. I remember when Kate and I uh, lived in Caracas, we, uh, not, you know, one of the first days we were there, we knocked on the, our neighbor's door, the apartment across the hall, and uh, just wanted to introduce ourselves. And, um, and in that very brief conversation, um, he, he said, I'm an engineer. And he was retired. He wasn't working yet, and or work, working at that time, and um, and we weren't talking about jobs or anything. But um, he that was very important to him, and he wanted to make sure we knew that he was an engineer. And I would guess he found a lot of his self worth and, and identity in that job that he had. So many people base their identity on being a successful doctor, lawyer, entrepreneur, mom, straight A student, this or that. Um, their work is not just what they do, it's who they are. And when work becomes your identity, your self-worth, um, Tim Keller said in that situation, if you're successful, work will destroy you by going to your head. And if you're not successful, work will destroy you by going to your heart. And what he meant by that, in your head, if you excel in your field, there's a strong temptation to generalize your success in that area to every area, to, to think you're smart at everything and good and better than other people at everything. You, you know, probably wouldn't admit that out loud, but there's a, a sense of, of arrogance and entitlement that can slowly uh, ruin relationships, steal empathy, and and cost you more than you bargained for. And with uh, the heart, how if you're not successful and you find your identity in your work, that can um, really deflate you, destroy you, and 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 uh, and and send you in a, a, a pretty downward spiral quickly. Uh, one one example of that is um, university students. Say, imagine top colleges across the country. Um, the kids that get to those top colleges often were the valedictorian in their high school. Um, they might be the smartest kid for miles, and and then they go into this college full of kids who were the smartest kid for miles and so they go from it so even though they are the top one percent academically of all kids their age in the country they might be the bottom one percent of all the kids that are around them and that can be devastating uh, unfortunately there's a, a lot of anxiety and depression and suicide uh, in in those um, schools for for that reason, uh, especially at a young age when you might not have even realized you were finding your identity in how smart you thought you were and 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 how and how you've done your job as a student. Unless you have a deep deep identity that is not grounded in your performance work is going to destroy you. And remember, Paul was not only apostle and leader in the church, but um, he made tents for a living, and that was what enabled him to do the work of planting and establishing churches. Another, um, another line I want to tell you about, Psalm 145. It says, the eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. I think it was Martin Luther reflecting on this and kind of writing about this. Said, um, you know, well, how does that happen? God gives food to his creation at the proper time. Um, it's not cloudy with a chance of meatballs, right? Like we we go to the store, we buy food, we you know gr maybe grow food in a garden. And so this reminds me of when my 
kids were in elementary school, I had the freedom to go into work a little bit late and got to get them ready for school and have breakfast. And we had all kinds of fun conversations around the breakfast table. And one of them was, was about where our food comes from. And I remember Zoe sprinkling some cheese on her omelet and, and we start talking about that. And it's like, well, cheese is a dairy product. So somewhere, someone milked the cow to make this cheese. And, and then we think, well, even before that, some people were caring for the cow. There was probably a, a vet involved. Um, probably somebody helped birth the cow. A rancher probably built a fence to keep the cow safe. All of that. And we start started going through. And think about it. Like somebody cleaned and processed the milk. Someone transported the milk to a facility where still others made it into cheese. Others packaged the cheese and boxed it up. Someone loaded the cheese onto pallets, onto a truck. A truck driver took it to a warehouse where people unloaded it and stored it at the warehouse for distribution. Another truck driver took it to Fred Meyer. Someone at the grocery store then put it on the shelf. And then that's where mom could pick it up and at the store and paid the cashier. Probably went over and said hi to Jeff Wall at the pharmacy and and then, you know, she brought it home. You kids probably helped her bring the groceries up the stairs and put it in the fridge. This morning I made an omelet and now Zoe's sprinkling cheese on it. And we're not even mentioning people who designed and built the machines and the tools and in making the cheese. People who paved the roads and um, made software used along the way and the finance folks who made sure everybody got paid and the custodians that kept all the workplaces clean. There's, there's so much more. So how does God care for his creation and give them food at the proper time? Through the jobs of tons of people. You see milking a cow, driving a truck, writing a paycheck, sweeping the floor, it's all God's work. So whether everyone in this chain acknowledges it or not, they were serving Jesus, they are serving God as he served his creation. So all work is God's work. Yeah, accepting, obviously, dishonest, exploitative work, um, but all, God, all work is God's work then, and then all work has dignity. Even the simplest menial job has dignity worth and value because it's part of serving God. It's part of God getting accomplished what he wants to on earth. So if we regard ourselves as servants of Jesus, we see our everyday work, changing diapers, selling insurance, teaching math, as a small part of God's work. And if all work is God's work, then the best way to honor God in your work is to do a really good job. And T Tim Keller once said, um, how should a Christian pilot honor God in his work? Land the plane. Land the plane every time. Do it well. Paul says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. You are serving the Lord Christ. That's in Colossians 3. So there's a day coming where Jesus will judge our work. If it's built on a foundation with gold and silver and precious stones, or is it wood, hay, and stubble that burns up in the fire? Eugene Peterson in the message translates verse 5 this way. So don't get ahead of the master and jump to conclusions with your judgments before all the evidence is in. When he comes, he will bring out in the open and place in evidence all kinds of things we never even dreamed of, inner motives and purposes and prayers. Only then will any one of us hear the well done of God. So Paul is appealing to the church at Corinth and to us to live now in light of that future day. So regard yourselves as servants of Jesus. Do your work as if he's your boss. Excel in your work. Build with the good stuff. Keep the end in mind as you live now. Are you feeling some pressure to perform, some weight on your shoulders to, to get it right, to excel in your job? 
I hope so. I, I hope so only because I want the gospel to relieve some of that pressure. Remember, you're not responsible for creating your servant identity. Jesus accomplished that on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, We're new creations. The old is gone. The new has come. King Jesus has made you his much-loved servant. And the Father has adopted you into his family as his child. And the Spirit empowers you and sends you as his ambassador and missionary. In, in Philippians 2, like we mentioned before, Paul is, says um, Jesus, when he's talking about Jesus taking on the form of a servant, he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Saying, you have the mind of Christ at your disposal. And in Romans 8, Paul says there's therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, now or in the future. And, and so we have the identity of a servant. We have the mind of Christ. We're free from condemnation. And it's this truth is already and not yet. There's a sense in which it's true now, and it will be fully, fully true sometime in the future. That's what Paul keeps reminding us of, that what we're in now is not all of it. There's, there's a day coming when everything will be set right. So it's, these are true for those who believe in Jesus. We get to live into it. As we increasingly regard ourselves as servants, work doesn't have to destroy us. And our disagreements don't have to cause irreconcilable differences. And we get to experience the favor of Jesus in our work as we let him guide it. And we get to experience unity as we think rightly about our leaders and about ourselves. So this is, this is true of us just like it's true when it, an eight-year-old little girl is adopted that day, day one, she's a child in a new family. But at dinner, she might still slide some food in her pocket, uh, living like a child of the street. And, but increasingly, as she grows up into her new identity, she realizes she doesn't have to. Similarly, as we grow up into maturity in Jesus, we get to live into this new gospel identity and, and realize we don't have to find our, our worth in our work. Um, and we don't have to be divided in the ways that um, we can so easily fall into. So our constant encouragement to one another in Soma is often be who you are. You are a servant of Jesus. And so let's uh, remind ourselves that that's true and live into that. It's not what we do that makes us who we are. It's what Jesus has done that makes us who we are. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are, um, that you've accomplished this magnificent work in, uh, in Jesus. I pray that you would help us to live into it, to grow up into it, and to understand that it, uh, living in your identity that you give us is better. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Feynman.